That beard he has was not always there. You'll hear the story. I've heard it quite a few times. It's unbelievable. Whoever wants to have the rabbi come to his community. We already had him in Bet Gavriel, in Forest Hills. We've had him in Shari Tova, in Kew Gardens. This is the first time he's here in Briarwood. If anyone has any other communities, whether it's Jamaica Estates, whether it's Hillcrest, whether it's Fresh Meadows, whether it's uh, Great Neck, whatever it is, please let us know. We'll be more than happy to organize the event. As you'll hear, the story is just so inspiring. I'm warning you. There should be like a warning. A warning, you know, before listening to, to his lecture that... Uh, you, you might change your life. <laughs> so uh, so it's fasten those seatbelts and uh, get ready to hear an amazing story by Alona Nava. So I guess without further ado, it is my pleasure, my honor, my privilege to call upon him once he finishes to organize his uh, video to come and tell us his inspiring story, unbelievable story. Any questions? Everything is clear? The lecture is going to be in English, yes, English. Good. The radio, the dinner, the big event. Hmm. This is yours? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Sure. Check. Is your pen? Yeah. No. Yeah. I have extra. That's fine. Thanks. No, no, I don't need it. Thanks. Sit, stand. Oh, uh, whatever you want. Sitting is better. Sitting is better, but how? This. Put this is on me? Yeah. Where do you need it? Here? Anyway. Very good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to see you again. Oh, shit. Baruch Hashem. just mentioned it in the Shmat. Okay. And who no, is his no, name? Just leave it in the Shmat? Okay. Okay, first of all, Baruch Hashem. Bechazli Hashem, I'm here. When there's a big, 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 big Kiddush Hashem to do, the Yetzer HaRa will do anything he can to stop it. So I had five things on the way to stop me. So must be that tonight is going to be a big Kiddush Hashem and a big mitzvah. Because the Yetzirah doesn't like when a bunch of Jews get together and something good is going to come out of it. So like Avraham Avinu went to, put a, to sacrifice his son, the Satan put a river, put a mountain, put so many things to stop him. So... Baruch Hashem, Bechazli Hashem, I'm here. So first of all, the night will be Leilud Nishmat Uriel Ben Sarah. And whoever needs refuah should have refuah. Whoever needs shiduch and iladim should have shiduch and iladim and parnasa. And everything should be Begilui, Begashmus, and Beruchnes. So, with your permission, I'm going to do a quick introduction. My name is Alona Nava. And... Since we're starting very late, then I'm going to get straight to the point. So my name is Alona Nava, and I grew up in Eretz Israel, and I grew up the most not religious that you can imagine. That's how I grew up. I grew up hating Hashem. I grew up hating religion. I grew up hating everything that has to do with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And I was taught that it's not true, that it's nothing there, that it's all stories. And for 28 years I grew up not only not believing, but rather on the, on the other way, completely despising. When somebody is religious, he can mehader be mitzvot, so I was mehader be averot. If avera would come to my hand, I would do it be chavana, on purpose. But Hashem had different plans. And 20, when I was 28... 13 years ago, I had what's called a near-death experience. I died for a couple minutes, and that's what you're going to hear tonight. So how I got there is less important. I like to always start with the, with the before-after. Come if you can't take it and pass it around. Just that you'll have a picture in your mind where I came from and how I started. But 
For 28 years, I grew up completely with no connection to God. And on a very special day, first of all, it was Shabbat. But more than that, it was Yudalid Nisan. Yudalid Nisan is the morning of Pesach. It's the day that we burn the chametz. It's the time when we finish cleaning the house, getting ready for Pesach. So the whole thing happened on a Shabbat and on Yudalit Nisan. And when I was a kid and when they taught me about Pesach, they told me, oh, yeah, you know, the Jews were in Mitzrayim and they were working very hard. And then came this guy with a long beard, Moshe Le, and he did some uh, hocus pocus and he got all the Jews out. And, uh, you know, they told me a story. But the story behind Yetziat Mitzrayim is that the Jews were in Egypt, Be'avdut, in slavery. They could not be uh, religiously free. And that day, Yudalit Nisan, is when they left. They broke out from Avdut, from slavery, into spiritual freedom. Which this is the day that marks for generations. That this is the day that has the most koach for somebody to break free from spiritual bondage, for spiritual slavery, and live for chirut, but spiritual uh, freedom. Now the story, 28 years is less important. Before we start a few very important things, is that the story is very long. And I'm mainly going to share with you the actual experience. Later on, we're going to have time for questions and answers. You might have a lot of questions. Try to keep it to the end because it's a very big crowd and must, might be that some people don't want to hear everybody's little question. Half the questions will be answered as I speak. And whatever was not answered later on, you can ans ask me whatever you want. But for the kavod of the, for the kahal, for the people, don't start every second asking a question because it's going to disturb the, the, the lecture. I promise you later on you can ask me whatever you want. I don't know what time they're going to throw us out of here, but till they throw us out of here, you can interrogate me. And the thing is that everything that I'm about to tell you is how I remember it, exactly how it happened. It's engraved in my memory like as if it happened this morning. But since it's so far removed from what we know, then I use my own words to describe it. And it's almost like a dream that a person has a very powerful dream. He wakes up in the morning, he remembers every detail of the dream, then he wakes up in the morning, he wants to tell the dream, and he can't, he can't explain it. He remembers every perfect detail. And the only way to kind of describe how I can't explain it is it's almost like explaining, trying to describe to a person who was born blind how the color blue looks. And he tells you, but I'm, uh, I never saw anything. Yeah, I mean, you know, blue is like green. Yeah, but I was born blind. So oh, it's like the sky, it's like the ocean. A person who was born blind, never saw anything, cannot imagine what you see. So everything that I saw, it's not something that we have here in this world that I can say, oh, it looks like this. So I use my own imagination to explain it as, as accurate as possible. So don't take every little word that I say and, and distort it. And the most important thing to remember is try to get into the mind frame of how I'm, how I'm experiencing it. So going back 13 years ago, Shabbos, Shabbat in the morning, Yudalit Nisan, everybody's getting ready for Pesach, burning their chametz, and I'm in Manhattan in a party. And this side already saw the picture, so they kind of know what kind of a party. But soon the picture will continue going, and you'll, the rest will know. Just if you can, give me back the picture, because sometimes I go to lectures, somebody walks out with a picture, and I'm running out of pictures already. <laughs> There's pictures online, you go, you can find, but believe it or not, I go sometimes places, I ask, where's the pictures at the end? Oh, no, somebody took it for a memory, a memory for a souvenir. So I was in Manhattan in a party, and somewhere in the middle, in the, in the morning of the party, somebody was passing around from the Hevre, from all the friends, like a smoking device, what you use to smoke drugs. And I didn't know what I'm taking. I thought, I don't know what I thought what I was taking. And suddenly I started feeling extremely, extremely bad. But not bad that I have to throw up or that I have, I have to faint or that I'm dizzy. 
I felt like I'm about to die. And there was a girl with me, and I told her, we got to leave the place because I feel very, very sick. And it was in Manhattan. We go out of the building. I just wanted to go home. We stop a cab. I go into the cab. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the car, scared because I know that I'm about to die. I know. It's not that I feel or I think or I understand. I know that I'm about to die. In a level what's called yediya, hasaga. The same way that you have a headache, you know you have a headache, nobody has to come and convince you you have a headache, nobody can come and explain to you how the head hurts you, but you know you have a headache. I knew that I'm about to die. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the car, scared, because I know I'm about to leave this world. And I can't breathe, and I open the window to get some air, and I look out the window and the whole world stopped. Everything froze. Like you look at a movie, you click the button, the movie stops, everything froze. And all that's going on in my mind, my mind is running 100 miles an hour, and all that's going on in my mind is I'm about to leave this world, and I messed up 28 years of my life, and I'm about to meet the creator of the world, and I don't even have a mitzvah. And if you would tell me five minutes before that, you know that there's a creator to the world, you know there's a God, I will tell you, you must be completely nuts. And if you would tell me five minutes before that, you know that you have a neshama in your body, and you know you have to do mitzvot, and you know when your neshama leaves the world, it goes up to Shamaim, has to give din v'cheshbon, and there's Gan Eden, there's Olam Abba, there's all sorts of things. If you would tell me that five minutes before that, I would think that you are completely metoraf, completely nutcase. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the car, and I know that there's a Kadosh Baruch Hu. I know there's a Borel Olam, a creator to the world. And I know that I'm about to meet him. And I know that I have a few minutes. And I'm about to leave this world and I can't even take one mitzvah. I don't even have a mitzvah. When you die, you don't take your money, you don't take your house, you don't take your diploma, you don't take anything. You can only take a mitzvah. Or Torah that you learned, the good deeds that you did. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the car and I'm 28 years old and I know that I don't even have a mitzvah to take with me. And the feeling that I have, imagine a person that decides to kill himself, chas v'shalom, go chooses the biggest bridge in Manhattan, stands on the top, looks down, takes a deep breath, and jumps. Imagine what's going on in that person's mind the second his feet leave the ground. <gasps> what did I do? I just killed myself. I can't jump up, and I have about a minute before I hit the ground. That's how I felt. <gasps> what did I do? I wasted 28 years of my life running after money, running after fun, running after women, running after nonsense. And now I can't reverse it. And I have a minute before I hit the ground, and that's it. And all that was going on in my heart, in Hebrew it's called Hirhurei Tshuva. Thinking of, wow, like what could have done? When a person wants to do Tshuva, he first thinks. He has a Hirhurim, he has thoughts. The Zohar says that if a person does a minute before he dies, he still will have to go through what he has to go through. Because he did a little thought, a little change of heart. And it seemed like this whole thing was maybe 10-15 minutes. The world is frozen, nothing moves. I'm looking around, everything is like a picture. And the second that I understand that there's nothing but Hashem, and Milvado, I cover my eyes and I say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, with Hashem's name, not Hashem. If you would ask me then, how do you know how to say Shema? I don't know. I said Shema once when I was Bar Mitzvah. But the Neshama knows everything. The Neshama knows when it's about to leave, it knows everything. And the second that I understood and I came to terms that there's nothing besides us, and not Milvado, then I say Shema Yisrael, and as I'm saying Shema Yisrael, I fall down on the girl that's sitting next to me. And you know the cabs in Manhattan, they have that partition between the front and the back. I see that partition, and I'm lying on the girl's body, and I, the first thing that I feel, that I'm like diving out of my eyes like you dive into a pool. And I wake up in this weird place, I don't hear anything, and I don't see anything, but the first thing that hits me was this amazing silence. There wasn't any sound. And we don't notice how much noise is around us all day long. 
If you all be quiet now for one minute, you're going to hear so much noise. You hear the air conditioning running, you hear a car, you hear noises. There was nothing, no sounds, mute, dead. And the next thing that I feel is that I'm like air, I'm like a cloud, I'm everywhere. I'm, 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 I'm not confined to a body. I can, I can, I'm like everywhere, like a cloud, and I don't have to go anywhere, I don't have to carry this bag of bones. And the third thing that I feel is that there's no time. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have a watch on my hand. I don't have any meetings to go to. I don't have to do anything. So I'm floating in this place of nothing. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. I'm like air. I'm like a cloud. I'm everywhere. And I don't have to go anywhere. No time. Like this perfect vacation. And as this is happening, I still had my thoughts. And you know, we all have our thoughts. We all have the thoughts to a point that our thoughts constantly run in our mind. The Midrash says that their thoughts are compared to a river. The same way that the river constantly flows, then our thoughts constantly flow. 24 hours a day, the thoughts are running in our mind. And if you're American, you think in English. If you're Israeli, you think in Hebrew. Whatever language you grew up, you have your thoughts. Now, if you're busy with what you're doing, you don't really concentrate on your thoughts. But when you're sitting in the car, or you're in the shower, or you're lying in bed, your thoughts are running in your mind, and you have conversations with yourself. Ah, you know, you tell yourself stories, sometimes you tell yourself jokes, sometimes you tell yourself the shonara, you make plans. So I, I had these thoughts, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, what happened? Where am I? What just happened? What happened? Where am I? And the same level of communication a thought, a voice, is telling me, you died. This is your death. And I'm like, what? That's how I die? And this voice is telling me, yeah, you died. And it's kind of pointing down. Now, there wasn't a hand, but it was more like in, you know, in a intellect. I understood it, and it's kind of like pointing down. And I understand that it's telling me to look down, and I look down like this, and I see my body on the girl, in the cab, I see the whole thing, I'm like the height of maybe like this ceiling, and I'm looking down, and this voice is telling me, you died, this is your death. And in my mind, I'm like, Ma, what? That's how I die? In the back seat of a car? That's how the story ends? Like, you don't, nobody, had a, nobody plans their death. Nobody really sits down and thinks, oh, I know I'm going to die. But if you do think of your death, you say, at least let me die when I'm like 90 years old with like 80 grandchildren and a whole dynasty and like a whole life. And if you're not going to die all, if I have to die young, at least let me die like an exciting death. Like go like 300 miles an hour on a motorbike and like crash into a wall. Like give me something exciting. I'm like that's how I die? You know, when I was in the army in Israel, we used to go on different missions. And I knew, you know, there's a chance I'm not going to come home. But at least I knew if I die, I die like a hero, you know, the something. And I'm looking down, I'm like, that's how I die in the back seat of a car in New York, like a bag of potato I'm thrown on the back seat. That's how they're going to remember me? The feeling was this embarrassment feeling that that's how I die. And the fact is that it is very important to the neshama, to the soul, how it leaves the world. If the death is very honorable to the body, then the neshama gets this honorable death. And if chas v'shalom, it's the other way around, the neshama feels this embarrassment that it died like, like, like a very embarrassing death. And I'm like flying over the body. I'm like the height of like maybe two, two floors. I'm looking down. I see the whole thing. And I'm not like upset or sad or I don't feel any pain. And then something happened very, very, very amazing. I feel that I like dive into this girl's body. And within a split second, I see her entire life. From the day she was born till that day. And I see her entire life running in front of my eyes. And I don't see her life like in order, like a baby, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I see like, like a mishmash, all, all, all the scenes of her life. I, like the past and the present, everything is like, like as if I'm seeing like 50,000 scenes at the same time. And it's not that I'm looking, in, like, looking at a screen and I'm seeing it. It's like I live in her body and I think her thoughts. So I hear her thoughts, and I feel her feelings. 
She's sad, I'm sad. She's happy, I'm happy. She's excited, I'm excited. And uh, I hear how she's freaking out that I'm dead on her. And I hear her thoughts. And I feel how she's getting all upset. And then I see like a little step into the future. And I see how they're telling my parents that I died. And I see my parents crying and my sisters crying. I see like a little step into the future. And I see everything at the same time. The past and the present and the future all like one big mess. And like as if I'm sitting in front of 50,000 screens and I see millions of scenes. And a lot of people ask me, how could it be that you still see her past, you see the present, you see the future? It doesn't make sense. So the short explanation is that when the neshama is in the body, it's restricted to the limitations of the body. So the body can only see a, diff- a certain distance, and the body can only hear a certain distance, and it can only hold a certain amount of weight, and the body can only live in the present. The body cannot see back and not see forward. But when the soul leaves the body, it has no limitations. It's not limited to the body. So the soul can see from one side of the world to the other side of the world. And the soul can hear 50,000 things at the same time. And the soul can see this, the past, the present, the future. The soul is not limited. And as all this is happening, I feel I'm being pulled up higher and higher and higher. And I see like a little bit more of the, the scene. And the cab is driving in Manhattan and I'm like a ma- magnet over the car. And suddenly the car goes under like this little bridge. And I go like in the bridge. And I see, I like calling it the graphic design of the world. And I'll tell you what I mean. Imagine you're looking at a website, you look at a computer, and you see this beautiful design, colors, pictures, buttons, everything is beautifully designed. You press a button, it opens a window, you press another button, plays a video. The whole website is like alive. But what's going to happen if you remove this graphic design, what would you see? You would see the code that creates this website. And if this website has a program, a software, you'll see another layer of code that creates this software. And I see how the whole world is created with this godly power. We know that with 10 speeches, Hashem created the world. Hashem speaks and He creates the world. And if for one second, Chas Shalom, Hashem will stop speaking, all the worlds will go back to where they came from. Like as if nothing was existed. We learn from the Torah from many, many places, Dvar Hashem, Ruach Piv, Hashem speaks with the attribute of Malchut, is Dibur, and He creates the world. Vayehi Rakia creates the Rakia. Vayehi, Vayehi Hashem speaks and creates the world. And how does He create the world? with 22 sophisticated tools that are the 22 letters of Lashon Kodesh, the letters. And each letter contains in it infinite amount of more letters. All that we know from Kabbalah, all the Gimatriot, how Aleph is one and Bet is two and all these combinations. And I see everything is like letters. Everything, everywhere that I look, endless amount of letters. Dvar Havaya Mechayet Olam, the godly power that creates the world. And I'm able to read the letters and understand what I see. I don't see it how we see it. How we see it is like very, very unintelligent way. This eye, this very, very old tool for the neshama. This is like a very, like, like for us, like a piece of wood. The neshama's tool to see things is way more sophisticated. And it's like as if I'm reading the letters and I understand what I see. And not because I'm Israeli and I know Hebrew. Because the Neshama can only read Lashon Kodesh. There's no other language up there. And I see how every letter is built from more letters and more letters and more letters. Endless amount of letters. And just on this point, I can talk for three hours just explaining everything. And this whole thing looked like I'm there maybe 50,000 years. Because every little detail was like magnified. And the car is like driving. And I'm like a magnet over the car and I keep going higher and higher and higher. And at some point I'm like the height of like maybe 10, 15 floors. I'm like flying over Manhattan. The cab is driving and I'm like a magnet over the car flying over Manhattan. I see the whole city from above. And there's one point that the car passes next to a building. And the same way that I like kind of dived into this girl and saw her entire life, I scan the entire building and within a split second I see everything that's going on in the building. 
hundreds of apartments, I see every apartment, what's going on. And I'm able to interact with each person. One room, a boy is crying. One room, a couple is fighting. One room, a person is sleeping. One room, a person is reading. And I'm seeing everything at the same time. Like as if I'm sitting here in the room and I know all of your thoughts. And I know how was your day. And I know what you ate for breakfast and I know what your favorite color. I know everything. I'm able to see each person individually. And here I always stop to say a funny story. That when I met my wife, we went on a shidduch, we went on a date. And on our first date, my wife told me, I heard you have a very interesting story how you became religious. Can you tell me? So I told her this story. Now, I was like 70% religious. She was 32.5% religious. She was born in America, not connected to anything with religion. When she was in college, she met a rabbi and started becoming closer to religion. And she told me that after the date, she didn't tell me during the date, but she told me after the date that when I got to this part for the, with the building, she said, everything made sense. And she told me the next day she threw her pants away, started wearing dresses, started eating kosher. And she told me, you know, for 10 years I'm backwards and forth with this whole religion thing. And nobody could answer one simple question. And when you told me the thing with the building, everything was clear. And she told me I didn't have an issue with God. I knew there's a God. I knew there's a creator to the world. I knew there's an Ashama. I knew there's a Lama. I knew everything. And that I didn't have a problem. I believed it. But my only question that nobody could answer was very simple. How can it be that there's 7 billion people in the world? Millions of creatures, trillions of animals and creatures. How can it be that Hashem knows me? You want to tell me that so many people and Hashem knows me? Can't be. So you know what? Let's not concentrate on all the world. Let's just concentrate on the Jews. You know what? Let's just concentrate on the religious Jews. So you want to tell me that on Yom Kippur, three million people, at the same time, all over the world, they're all in shul, praying, and God can hear me? Can't be. How he can hear three million people? So if this is the case, and he doesn't know me, so what's the point? Because he doesn't even know me. Why should I bother? Why should I be dressed snua? Why should I eat kosher? He doesn't even care. Why should I pray? He doesn't even listen to me. How can it be that he knows me? I understand he knows big rabbis, very famous people, but me? And she told me, when you, what are you? This is neshama like flying in there like a leaf. You were able to see in each building, each room, each person, and have this personal relationship with each person made me understand how so much more so how Hashem knows every little creature in the world like as if there's nothing else but that creature. So much more so an animal, so much more so a human being. Alachat kama ve kama, a Yehudi, a Jew. Hashem knows each one of us like as if there's nothing else but that person. Every thought, every emotion, every feeling, every contemplation in our mind, Hashem is there, knows. Every time in the most closed room, Hashem sees every little thing, every thought. Bochen klayot valev, Hashem knows every little thing. And she told me that part clicked. That's it. The next day, I threw all my stuff away. I, that's it. Became religious. And a few weeks later, she decided to marry me. Up until today, she's not 100%, but I'm sure she's happy. <laughs> she barely sees me, but... <laughs> but anyways, at least I got one person religious. So, up until this point, first of all, it seemed like I'm there... Thousands of years. Because there wasn't any time. I couldn't tell if it's a minute, if it's a second, if it's an hour, if it's a day. But everything was good, calm, relaxed, no pain, no worries. Amazing. I'm seeing like these godly revelations and everything is amazing. And suddenly without any preparation, without any warning, I feel something grabs me from behind and like pulls me into this place. And within a split second, I wake up in this totally different place. But this time it's extremely scary, complete darkness, I don't see anything. All I feel is that something is holding me, like crushing me. And I don't see anything, I don't hear anything, I don't feel anything. But I feel this pain, this pain because this thing is like a hundred thousand pounds on me, like crushing me. And I feel this thing is like pulling me up 
And as the more it's pulling me, the more painful it becomes. And it feels like it's trying to pull me through this funnel. And the funnel is like full of blades. And more it pulls me, it's like ripping pieces off me. And I'm screaming from pain. I can't take this pain. And I hear my screaming, and the screaming is painful for me. And I don't know what it is. I don't know where I am. I don't know how I got there. I'm like in this weird place. And all I feel is this fear that there's no words to describe it. It's not a human fear even. And the worst part was, first of all, I didn't know how I got there. I didn't know what's holding me. I didn't know where I am. All I see is like pitch black and I can't move. But the worst of all was that I didn't know if I'm ever getting out of there. I didn't see an end. And when you don't have a definition to the situation, the situation is much worse. And I'll give you an example. Imagine, chas v'shalom, a person gets sentenced to go to jail for 40 years. So 40 years, that's a pretty big sentence. But at least he says, oh, you know what? It's not that bad because I'm going to have where to sleep and I'm going to have where to eat. I'm going to have friends and I'm going to have where to eat. And, you know, I, the bad situation is defined. And I have a lawyer. Maybe we can appeal, get some years off it. And I have family. They'll come and visit me. And I, after that, after 40 years, I'm out. But there's some type of a definition to the bad situation. Imagine, on the other hand, a soldier that Chas Shalom gets captured by the enemy. Imagine what's going on in his mind. <gasps> he doesn't know what's happening. Maybe they're going to kill me in a minute. Maybe they're going to torture me now for 20 years. Maybe I'll never see my family. He doesn't have any connection to the world. Nothing, nothing is protecting him. And every noise that he hears, oh, what are they going to do now? Maybe they're going to come now to beat me up. Maybe they're going to come to kill me now. This Iyadiya, this not knowing what's waiting, that's worse. That's the worst from anything. And that's how it felt. That I didn't know what's holding me. I didn't know what's going on. All I feel is this pain that literally there's no words to describe it. Because there's no such a pain even in this world. And fear of the unknown. And the worst part of it, first of all, it felt like I'm there, not exaggerating, a million years. Of this torture, this endless torture. It felt like a person that is drowning, that he doesn't have any more air. But it wasn't ending. And the worst part of it was that I finally, I kind of figured out that this suffering was from only one thing. That I didn't have any connection to God. The main source of life, I didn't have any connection. You know, when a person is not religious, and he does a lot of, lot of averot, a lot of sins, some sins are so severe that the Torah teaches us that the soul gets cut off. Karet. The soul gets cut off. Somebody who eats on Yom Kippur, eats chametz on Pesach, all sorts of bad things, all sorts of forbidden relations. In our generations, half of it we don't have. It's eating kochim, it's in things from Bet HaMikdash. But we still have in our generation a lot of these sins that the, the reaction is severe. The Torah defines it as karet or mitah bidei shamayim, death. The soul gets chopped off. And I feel that I don't have any connection to the source of life, to the, to the creator of the world. That was the suffering, that I didn't have anything to, to grab on. And it felt like I'm there maybe a million years of suffering. And the worst part was it that I didn't have any end. It didn't have a definition, okay, you're going to be here for two million years and then it's over. And at some point, I kind of realized what's going on. I knew what's going on. I, at some point, realized everything. And it's very easy to explain because in this world there's two realities. Truth and a lie. And somebody can create a lie and hide behind this lie and nobody will ever know. But this only works in this world. Because in the spiritual world there's only one reality. Emet. Truth. You cannot distort the reality. So I knew exactly what's going on. I knew who I am. I knew where I am. I knew what's holding me. This black, scary thing was Malach Amavit, this angel of death that comes to rip the neshama out of the body. And I knew exactly everything. I knew where I'm going. I knew what's going to happen, which made it even worse, because I knew what's going on. But on the other hand, I knew that the only thing that can get me out of this is only Hashem. And Od Milvado. There's nothing else that can come and help me. And it was like as if I'm screaming to Hashem, help me. Get me out of here. I'll do whatever you want. I'm sorry. And it's like as if I scream to Hashem maybe a million years. 
nothing. I'm in this darkness and it's just getting worse. It's not that I'm sitting there and relaxing. This malach hamavet is like ripping my soul out. And I feel this pain that there's no, there's no words to describe it. And it's just getting worse because it's putting me higher and higher and higher. And I'm screaming to Hashem, forgive me, I'll do whatever you want. I'll be the best Jew ever. Just forgive me. Give me a chance. I'll do whatever you want. I can't take this anymore. And I'm screaming to Hashem maybe two billion years of severe torture and pain and I don't hear and don't see nothing. And it's becoming worse and worse. And at some point, after like two billion years of torture, I see this like dot of light, this microscopic dot of light. And it sounds like a cliche, but the, it's, it was the light at the end of the tunnel. Can you imagine after two million years, two billion years of torture, and I suddenly see a light, and I know that if I can somehow get to this light, then I'm saved. And I'm screaming to Hashem, I'll do whatever you want. Give me a chance. I'll prove myself. I'll be the best Jew ever. Whatever you want, I'll do. And this light is coming closer to me and closer to me and closer to me, becoming bigger and bigger. At some point, everything was this light. Everywhere that I looked was this bright, bright white light. It was like everywhere. Everywhere that I would look was this bright light. And at the same time, as I'm seeing this bright light, I see it at the same time in the shape of a triangle. And I know that behind this light is Hashem. It was just obvious. I didn't need an explanation. It was obvious that behind this light is the creator of the world. And it wasn't a feeling of fear or something like that. It was a feeling like, like, like of awe. Oh, like the biggest thing of the universe is standing in front of me. And I knew that if I can somehow touch this light, that I'm saved. And I'm screaming to Hashem, like, save me, do what, I'll do whatever you want. And it felt like as if Hashem is telling me, why are you even bothering me? Why are you even calling me? You saw, you know everything, you know what you did, you know everything. Like, why are you, where do you even come up with the chutzpah to call me? And it suddenly felt like as if a hand reached out and grabbed me and pulled me into this light. And within a split second, I'm like sucked into this light. And I only found one way to kind of define and describe how it felt. Imagine you take a computer and you connect it to the internet. And before you connect it to the internet, this computer is a piece of metal that's worth nothing. And once you connect it to the internet, any question that you have, all you do is Google it. And within a split second, endless amount of information is in the tip of your toes. You just need to Google the question and you get the answer. It felt like I got connected to the main source of information. And within a split second, endless amount of information was downloaded to me. Instantly, I was this genius. I got connected to the main source of everything. And instantly, I know everything. I was the genius. And this information was this amazing pleasure. It felt like this water is washing me with information. It felt like I'm being electrified with information and it was pleasure that there's no words to describe it. There's no such a pleasure even in, in this world to say, oh, it felt like that. You know, there's a, there's a it teaches and the, the Gemara says that the neshamot of the tzaddikim, the souls of the righteous men and women, they're sitting in Gan Eden they're sitting in Gan Eden and just enjoying, not even the Hashem, just the ziv, the end, the glory, the, the shine of the glory of Hashem. And the Gemara says, you know, yeah, we can't even imagine what's this pleasure, what's this tanug. And it even goes to the, to the lengths to say, even if you take all the pleasures of all the millions and trillions of people from all 5,000 years, combine all these pleasures together, it's not even a second in Gan Eden. And it felt like this pleasure that if she, there's, no, there's no way to describe it. And the pleasure was that I was fed this endless amount of godly wisdom. Instantly I was a genius. I just knew everything. And this information came like with two channels. One channel was that instantly I was a genius. I just knew everything. And it's not that I knew things that have to do with this world. This world looked like you're giving a couple of blocks of Legos to a two-year-old and he's putting the blocks together, when I like, as if looked back at this world, it looked like nothing, like this most unadvanced world. And I was 
this instantly this genius. It's like I knew all the chokhmat of the world, all this godly wisdom of all the universe. And the second channel of this information was like as if I saw the entire world from the day it was created till the end, one big panoramic picture. I see the entire world, how it looks like this one long big picture, this perfect, perfect master plan. This genius plan that we cannot understand. We see this world like a piece of a puzzle of a million piece puzzle. And you imagine like you're trying to do this puzzle and you pick up one piece and you look at the piece, nothing makes sense. You have to put in all the pieces together. And the way I saw the world, like, like, as if it was like one big picture. Everything made sense. Everything was this genius master plan. Tochnit geonit. That we cannot understand. Because we only see one dot, one piece of the entire puzzle. And we're looking at this piece, and we're like, what kind of a world is this? All I see is terror attacks, and bombing, and holocaust, and diseases, and death. Well, what kind of a world is this? Where is Hashem here? Yeah, but we only see one piece from a million piece puzzle. So this piece doesn't make sense. And I was able to see this panoramic picture how everything made sense. Everything was this genius plan. And as I see all this and everything makes sense and I'm this genius and I'm feeling this pleasure that there's words that cannot describe it, I feel I'm like stuck in a bubble and I, I'm not part of it. I can't, I can't be part of it. And as I'm seeing this amazing giluim, this godly revelation, and this pleasure that words cannot explain even, I feel the complete opposite. That I have no connection to it. I'm stuck in a bubble. Like as if they're telling me, we're, we're very sorry, you didn't choose to be on this side, so now you got to go. Kind of like taking a little kid to an ice cream store and walking the kid into the ice cream store and telling him, look at all the treats, look at all the lollipops, here's the ice creams, here's the cakes, okay, now we got to go home. Like as if they showed me all this beautiful thing of all this universe. And then they're telling me, we're very sorry. You didn't choose to be part of this group. You got to go. You chose to be on the beach that day. You can't imagine. There's no words to describe this suffering being torn away from it. It's like as if they showed me this beauty of all this universe. This genius plan of Hashem. And there's like, we're very sorry. But you don't even have one little mitzvah even, to be part of it. You got to go. And it felt like I'm being pulled out of this. I'm like fighting to, to, to stay there. I'm begging, leave me here. I, want, I, 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 I just want to stay. No, you got to go out. You got to go. You don't belong here. There's no words to describe this suffering, that I'm not part of this master plan. And they're like ripping me out of this place, throwing me into this room. I wake up in this huge room, all that I feel that I'm completely, completely naked. I don't even have nothing. I'm like standing naked. Now there wasn't a body, so I wasn't naked from clothes, but I was completely naked. And the room was pitch, pitch black. I don't see anything. All I see everywhere I look, millions of eyes looking at me. Everywhere that I look, I see millions of eyes looking at me. And I'm like transparent. They see through me. And these millions of eyes are all the neshamot of all the Jews from all generations, standing around me like a ring. Everybody looking at me. And the feeling that I had, that I'm the only rasha, everybody around me at tzaddikim, um, I'm the only rasha that everybody because of me are suffering. Now we know the Mishnah teaches us that when a person does a good deed, a mitzvah, he creates himself a levush, a spiritual garment. So you do a mitzvah, you create yourself this spiritual garment that covers the nefesh. Later on in Gan Eden, this is the levush that allows you to get this godly revelation. If chas v'shalom, a person did an avera, he creates a blemish on this levush, a stain. So the same way that you have a stain on your jacket, you take it to the dry cleaner and they steam it. So if chas v'shalom, a person did an avera, this, this stain on this levush, so either the person is lucky and he does tshuva and he goes to Yom Kippur and Yom Kippur memarek, washes the neshama off. If chas v'shalom a person did not do that and the neshama goes up to shamaim and the nefesh, the levush, has this stain, the nefesh has to go through a process to remove it. It's called genom. 
There's many different ways how you wash the neshama, the levushim. But the fact is that if at least a person has mitzvot, the nefesh is dressed with this levushim. I didn't even have a levush. I was standing there naked. Millions of eyes, all these souls are looking and seeing through me. There's a Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah that says that when the neshama goes up to Shamaim, all the neshamot come down to greet this neshama. And everything that this person ever said, thought, did, anything, is all written in the air. And all the neshamot come and they read the resume. And if the person was busy with mitzvot and busy with learning Torah, and everything that came out of his mouth was honest and truth, the neshamot read it and they marvel. Wow! As the yofi, wow! The neshamot marvel the achievement. If chas shalom, it's the other way around. If the person was only thinking crooked things, speaking lies, speaking Nashon Ara, doing Averot, all the Neshamot read it. That's how the Gemara explains it. And they, they look at the Neshama and they're like, that's what you did down there? And the Neshama experiencing this, this busha, this shame. And I'm standing there in this middle of this room, completely naked, because I don't even have a lavush. And millions of Neshamot are looking at me and I feel like they're looking through me. Know everything about me. And there's no words to describe this shame, this busha, this embarrassment, that they know everything about me. First, they know everything about me. So every distorted thought that I ever had, everybody sees. More than that, it's a great shame. It's an embarrassment for the neshama to come down to this world and not even be occupied with Torah and mitzvot. And the feeling was that I, I literally don't, didn't know what to do myself but from this shame. The shame was worse than the pain from that black thing that brought me. And worst of all that, this feeling was between me and all of you. And all of you were there, because the neshamot are up there. What we have here is a little piece of the neshama is in this body. The neshamot, even when a, pe a person is alive, the main part of the neshama is upstairs. The worst part was not between me and the, all the neshamot. It felt like Hashem is standing in front of me. And it felt, you know, when a person is embarrassed, his, his reaction is to put his head down from the shame. It felt like I'm with my head down, and if I lift up my head, I see Hashem. It felt, mamash, that Hashem nitzav alav, looking at me. And I'm so embarrassed that I can't even lift up my head. And I knew, it was just obvious, that if I lift up my head, I see Hashem. And the feeling was, not that Hashem wants to rip me to pieces. Not that He wants to torture me, or punish me. It felt I broke his heart. It felt like a father that sent a son on a mission and I totally messed it up and it felt like I, bro I broke Hashem's heart. That I disappointed him. It didn't feel like Hashem is standing there with a, with a baseball bat waiting to beat me up. No, it was the other way around. It felt like Hashem is telling me, what did you do? I sent you down to this world with a list this long of things to do. And a list this long of things not to do. You didn't even get one right. You messed it up. Everything I told you to do, you didn't do. Everything I told you not to do, you did. You completely messed it up. It felt like I broke Hashem's heart. And I knew that this room is a courthouse. And I knew I'm about to be judged for every little thing. I knew the fear that they're pushing me. I, I was like begging them, please, please, don't, don't take me in there. Please, I'm begging you, don't take me in there. No, you got to go in. And I knew that every little thing that I ever did is about to be all opened. And all these millions of eyes are all there looking. And I know that I'm about to be judged. And I'm like kind of looking up. I'm like in front of a black wall. And I know there's judges in front of me. I can't see anything. I don't see anything. I just see a black wall. And you know the Mishnah teaches us in Masachet Avot that when a person does a good deed, does a mitzvah, he creates himself a sanegor, a defense attorney. And when a person does an avera, chas shalom, he creates himself a kategor, a prosecutor that comes and prosecutes against him. I had some type of dare, daring and I looked to my left and I see battalions of prosecutors, battalions, standing there like demons with files. Everything that I ever did. And I had the chutzpah to look to my right, 
and I see two defense attorneys. And one was crippled, the other one was blind. The third one didn't want to show up that day. It sounds now funny. And they're kind of telling me, you want to say something before we start? What are you going to say? What can you say? So at this point, they're telling me, you don't want to say anything? We're about to start. And at this point, they're showing me my entire life from the day I was born till that day. Now, it's not shown on a big screen. It's like as, as if I live my life again. And I'm in my body again. Just at this time, everything is slow motion. And everything that I ever did is pointed out. Here you stole, here you lie, here you cheated, here you did this, here you did this. Everything that I ever did is pointed out. And all these millions of the Shemot, they're all there. So every person that I ever lied to is standing right here. Why did you lie to me? And every person that I ever stole from, it was you. And every person that I ever cheated in business is standing right here. Why did you cheat me? You owe me money. And every person that I ever had a thought about them is standing right there. Why did you think that? That's what you thought about me? That's what you did? There's no words to describe this shame. I always make a joke that I was dead and I didn't even know where to bury myself. And everything is pointed out. Now it's not that it's pointed out, here you stole, here you did this. They're showing me the avera, the sin, and right away they're showing me the spiritual blemish that was caused by the sin. And I'll tell you what I mean. One second. Amen. Can I bother you in the back? I didn't press the record button in the camera. You did? Yaniv did. Yaniv did? It's red? Or green? It has to be red because I see the light. It has to be, have light in front of you. Oh, now it's on. Huh? Okay. So at this point, they're showing me every little sin that I ever did. But the worst was that they're showing me the spiritual blemish. And I'll tell you what I mean. When a person, chas v'shalom, does an avera, there's a chain reaction what happens. The first thing that happens is that he did the opposite of Hashem's will. Aside, epech ratzon Hashem. The king told you to do this and you didn't do it. The king told you not to do this and you did that's the first thing that happens, which in itself is a big thing. Worse than that, the second the person does this sin, he creates this blemish on this levush. Now, if the sin is small, then the blemish is small. If the sin is big, the blemish is big. If the sin is severe, the levush gets torn. And if the sin continues over and over and over, it's another sin, another sin, another blemish, another blemish. And the person has to do tshuva, and wipe off this sin. If chas v'shalom, the sins are severe, even tshuva, even Yom Kippur doesn't really help. He has to go through Yisurim, and there's a whole process. The Gemara explains, if the person is lucky, he does it in this world. If he's not lucky, then Hashem has to deal with it up there. The next thing that happens, the Gemara explains that when a person does an avera, right away he creates a malach, an angel. Malach habala, a destructive angel that comes and stands next to him. It's called a mashchit, and he comes to annoy him all day long till he kills him. So if a person did a hundred of a he has a hundred malachim around him all day long annoying him. All day long. So he gets a ticket and he gets in a car accident and he fails years and loses money. And every little thing, they're standing around him, annoying him till he kills them. Huh? How do you kill them? With tshuva? Tshuva and masim tovim. As I, we can get into that later. How do you kill it? But yeah, tshuva kills them off. The next thing that happens, Kabbalah explains that you create chas v'shalom when a person does an avera, what's called a klipa, this spiritual, spiritual uh, bacteria, this germ, this spiritual germ, exactly like you have a germ that comes and attacks the body and it has chas v'shalom, a, a disease, this is like a spiritual bacteria. And worse above all that, is that the second that person did an avera, he created a blemish in all the spiritual worlds. Like he, this kera, this torn, all around the world, all the universe. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Imagine there's a, a, a famous picture in a big museum somewhere in Europe 
that the picture is worth half a billion dollars, and everybody comes all around the world to see this beautiful picture that somebody 300 years ago took a bunch of paints, threw it at the canvas, made like this, and everybody comes to marvel this beautiful picture. Now imagine somebody walks into this museum with a bucket of black paint and throws it at the picture and ruins the picture completely. So what happens? First of all, he gets arrested. Then he goes to jail. Then he has to pay a fine. But this is his issues corresponding to the person's issues. He has to do tshuva. The neshama has to go to Gerom Chas Shalom. But worse than all that, he ruined the picture. Nobody can enjoy this picture ever again. Not one person in the universe can come to this museum and enjoy this picture. He ruined it for everybody, and it's irreversible. And that's the spiritual blemish. So when a person does an avera, forget about his own consequences. He makes this blemish in the universe that hurts everybody. So a lot of people say, ah, leave me alone, I'll deal with it when I get there. It's my problem. No, it's not your problem. It's everybody's problem. Because if I chas v'shalom do an avera, Everybody suffers. And if I do on the other way a mitzvah, oh, everybody benefits. Every mitzvah that I do, every mitzvah that you do, the entire universe benefits. If people around the world will see what happens to the world when we do a mitzvah, everybody would worship us. But at this point, it's not like that. But right now, if a person does the opposite, avera. He messes it up for everybody. All the neshamot suffer from that. The world suffer from that. He brings tzaros to the, to the world. And that's what they showed me. Here you stole, ah, we don't care about the stealing. Look what you did here. Here you cheated in business, okay. But look what you did here. There's no words to describe it. Because there was so much of it. And at some point they were telling me, okay, Habibi, <laughs> you're like a lost case. You have nothing here, okay? You know, so let's see what we can put together. So when you were eight days old, your parents didn't really ask my permission, but they circumcised me. So they told me, even though it's not even your mitzvah, it's your father's mitzvah, but we'll give you a mitzvah for this one. And when you were bar mitzvah, you put filin on, so we'll give you another mitzvah. Even though you really didn't care about the mitzvah. And one time a dollar fell out of your pocket, and somebody hungry picked it up and ate, so we'll give you tzaka for this one. And one time you helped your mom, and one time you were good to this person, and one time you did this, and they were like trying to, to gather some mitzvot together, and they told me like, there's nothing. There's nothing to work with even. Mainly you have like, you know, 50-50, we can do something with it. But you have like 99.9, and nothing. So they're kind of telling me, look, you're like a lost case. We have nothing to do with you. But at this point they're telling me, look, we're going to give you a deal. And you have two options. The first option is you go back to the black thing that brought you here, and he's going to finish the story, which that wasn't really an option. The second option is that you go back down to this world, and you have three conditions. The first condition is, is that you have to live your life like a Jew. And at this point, they're showing me my entire life, forward from that day till the end and I see myself with this long black beard with a black suit I see my entire life I see my wedding I see my wife I see my kids I see my whole life forward and they're telling me that's how you have to live your life now they're not telling me you have to be Ashkenazi Sephardi Hasidi they're telling me like a Jew in Shamaim there's one way to be a Jew here we make all sorts of groups but in Shamaim there's one way and they're telling me, this is the path you have to walk on, and you can't make your own rules. And more than that, you cannot come here after 120 years and say, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> oh, they didn't tell me. Oh, my parents didn't send me to yeshiva. Oh, that day I was really tired. I didn't feel like waking up that day. They're telling me, you cannot come back here after 120 years and say, I didn't feel like it. I didn't want to. And this is your life. And I see my entire life running. One time, another time, another time. They're showing me like this movie of my future. And they're telling me, that's how you have to live your life. You cannot make up rules, and you cannot bend the rules, and you cannot make up things, and find all sorts of people that will tell you, this is allowed. Oh, this is not so important. Ah, this is not really, really big. Oh, this Hashem doesn't really care about it. Shalom Edaber Bechalot, completely distorting the rules. That's the first condition. The second condition is, 
is that you have 28 years of debt. So you know what? Till Bar Mitzvah will forgive you. So you have 15 years of debt. You have to pay it back. So the fact that you go and you stole somebody's credit card, and you went and spent $100,000 on the credit card, and then you got caught. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Here's the card. I'll never use it again. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the card, but where's the $100,000 you spent on it? Now, that, not that I stole somebody's credit card, but they're telling me for 15 years, you made a mess. You stole, you have to give it back. You cheated in business, you owe that person money. You insulted somebody, you have to ask for forgiveness. You think to do tshuva is to put a yarmulke on your head and grow a two-foot-long beard? No, that's the, that's the costume. Doing tshuva is going back and fixing what you messed up. So you have 15 years of debt. So you have to fix that. And the third condition is that you have to tell every living person that you meet what you saw. You cannot hide. You cannot keep it to yourself. You cannot not tell anyone. You have to tell every person that you meet what you saw. Now, I wasn't really in a place of saying, you know what? That's not such a good deal. Why don't you let me consult with my attorneys, give me a day or two, and I'll give you an answer. I didn't have that option. I was like, <laughs> where do I sign? When's the, when's the next elevator going down? And they're telling me, no, 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 relax, Habibi. Don't, uh, shway, shway. Don't, don't, don't jump. Lat, lat. You have to think about it because you cannot come back here after 120 years and tell us that you didn't feel like waking up that day to pray or that you didn't feel like doing this. This is the rule. You cannot come back here, make a good decision. And I'm like, just let me go down. I'll do whatever you want. And it felt like I'm literally shaking my hands with Hashem. Like as if I'm doing a deal with Hashem. And the second that I shake my hands with Hashem, it felt like Hashem pushed me. I felt this impact like a, like a train hit me. And it felt like Hashem pushed me and told me, to You have to do tshuva. And the second that Hashem pushed me, He pushed me into my body. And that same second I wake up, my eyes open up. And I get up in the car, completely not connected to the world. The girl is screaming, the cab driver is screaming, a whole, whole mess. One second. And I don't remember anything, I don't, I don't see anything, I'm like completely, completely out of it. And the girl is screaming, and I don't remember anything. And more than that, I don't remember even one detail from what I just told you. What I told you now is maybe 1% of the entire thing. And I don't remember anything. And I'm completely out of it. And the girl later told me that I was mumbling something, took me, something took me. All that I knew is that I have to do a mitzvah. Now you saw how I look in the picture, like I'm a shogun. The picture is like a nice picture. Once, a couple times, my mom went with me to lectures and she was like, why do you carry such a horrible picture? At least like a nice picture of you. So I started carrying, out, carrying me a nice picture. But I have long hair, tattoos all my body, piercings all over my face. And all that I can think of is that I have to do a mitzvah. Now we're going to fast forward. Later on you can ask about that. We went to the hospital. Anyways, I got back home. And all that I know is that I have to do a mitzvah. And at that point I have a friend who started becoming religious. And every time that he would meet me, he would tell me, you want to put filin on? And I was like, no, <laughs> this is not for me. And then I went, wait a minute, I have to do a mitzvah, let me call my friend. So I called my friend, 6 o'clock in the morning, it was Saturday. He wasn't so religious, he picked up the phone. And I tell him, Itzik, you have to come now, I have to put filin on. <laughs> so imagine his face on the other side of the phone, he's telling me, what? Tell him, Itzik, you have to come right now, I have to put filin on. So he tells me, you can't, it's Shabbat. I told him, who cares what this is today? I have to put filin on. He's like, so he tells me in Hebrew, Shtagata? You lost it? No, Itzik, don't ask any questions. You have to come right now, and I have to put filin on. And he tells me, you can't, it's Shabbat. So I told him, but a whole year you're trying to put filin on me. Now is your chance. So you're becoming technical, Shabbat, no Shabbat. Who cares what day is it today? And he's trying to explain to me, you can't put filin on Shabbat. And I tell him, so I have to do a mitzvah, take me to a synagogue. And he tells me, Makara, what happened? Told him, Itzik, you can't ask any questions. That I have to do a mitzvah. So he tells me, why don't you come tonight? It's Pesach. It's Lel Sedel. Told him, oh, that sounds very religious. So where do I have to go? So he gives me the address. 
That night I go to my first Lel Seder in Borough Park in a religious family and I do the first Seder in my life. And I don't remember one detail from what I told you. What I told you now is literally not even a percent from all that I remember. All I knew is something very, very weird happened because I felt I'm a completely, completely different person. Up until that day, I was this rough, rough Israeli. Every word that came out of my mouth was a curse. Somebody would look at me the wrong way, I would beat him up. I was like this rough guy. Suddenly I'm this nice guy. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I go to work the next day, how are you feeling today? And everybody's like, what? And I would look in the mirror at that time, and I had like long hair, and I would look and it looked like normal. Suddenly I look in the mirror and I'm like, ugh, what are these things? And I don't know what happened. For two weeks, I feel something weird happen, and I don't know what happened, and I thought, I didn't know what to think. Two weeks pass. One night, I'm half asleep, half awake. Suddenly, everything that I told you, plus the 99% that I didn't tell you, everything pops up. In a split second, I'm getting all these visions in my mind. Everything just pops up in my mind. <gasps> I wake up in the middle of the night, scared. The first thing that I do, the girl was sleeping next to me, and I wake her up. Now, remember the beginning, I told you that I dived into her body, and I saw her entire life? I start asking her questions. Tell me, when you were seven, this and this happened to you? And she's like, how do you know? And I tell her, when you were eight, this and this ever happened to you? She was like, yes, how do you know? Now, I didn't tell her, how do I know? I just told her, does this happen to you? Yes. Did this happen to you? Yes. How do you know? Now, in my mind, I had a serious problem. Because in my normal mind, that's not normal. I was a normal person. This is not a normal thing. Things like this don't happen. It doesn't make sense. So I ask her another question. Did this ever happen to you? When you were 13 and you were in this, in this city, and in this age, this and this happened to you? She's like, how do you know? Now in my mind, I had a serious problem because I was like, wait a minute. They're looking at me. I'm, I, I'm signed on a deal. I, I got to be Jewish. Now I didn't want to tell her because I was like, if I'm going to, she, she tells me, how do you know? And, and I told her, if I'm going to tell her, how do I know? She's going to think I'm nuts. Now I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I was like, if I'm going to go now to any person and tell him, this is what happened to me, they'll be like, uh, okay. Relax, relax, sit down. Here, put your hands in this jacket. Take this pill. The doctor's coming in a few minutes. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Now, I didn't know what religious people think. In my mind, the religious people were not cases. You know what it, was, what it was for me? I looked at religious people. All I saw is these weird people, dressed weird, with long beards, and the breakfast is stuck here, and lunch is stuck here, and they never take a shower, and they swing chickens over their head. I was like, these are like lunatics. So I didn't know what the religious people think. So I was afraid to go to a rabbi. I was like, they're probably more crazy than me. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to tell it to anyone. So I packed up my bags. I, at that point, I lived in New York. I moved to Chicago. I was like, I got to go far away, and I'll figure it out. So I told my friend, I need to become Jewish. What do I need to do? So he gave me the basics. You know, you can eat meat and dairy, and you can eat all sorts of animals that you really like, and you can do this, and you can do that, and you have to put fillin in the morning, and if you have to put talit, and you have to do, you know, Shabbat. So I took the basics. I was like, okay, 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 that's enough, that's enough. I packed my bags, and I moved to Chicago. And I lived there for a year and a half. And the whole year and a half, it felt like Hashem held my hand and tell me, it's okay, you're normal, everything's fine, just do what you need to do. And I didn't tell it a year and a half to anyone. Because I was afraid, I was embarrassed. But I started becoming religious. Now imagine when you're 28 years old to suddenly switch your life. It's almost impossible. Because in my mind, I was like, okay, I don't mind putting the filling in the morning. And I don't mind eating the meat and dairy. No, no eating. Yeah, that's easy. And I'll stop eating these animals that I like. And I don't mind the, the basics. But oh, now you're coming at me with the big things. Ah, it's an invention. It's not really real. So I would make up in my mind all sorts of excuses why I don't have to do everything else and why it's good just to do a little bit. And the thing is that in my mind, what didn't make sense, I didn't accept. So I remember once I read in the Siddur this very fine print, and it says that every time that you leave the bathroom, you have to wash your hands three times, and you have to say a bracha. So I was like, okay, that's easy, I'll, I'll do it. So I went and bought this funny cup, 
And every time I came out of the bathroom, I would wash my hands three times, and I would read the bracha asher yatsar. And in my mind, I thought I'm like a, a tzaddik. I thought I'm like the most tzaddik in the generation. I was like, ah, nobody does that. I'm so, pff, I'm like, like a rebbe. One, not, one time, my friend Itzi came to visit me, and he tells me, oh, oh I see you do netilat yadayim. I told him, you know what I do? <laughs> Every time I come out of the bathroom, I wash my hands three times, and I say a bracha. So he tells me, eh, pff, that's nothing. You know what the real religious people do? They go to sleep, and they put a bucket next to their bed, and they put this cup next to the bucket, and then they wake up in the morning, they don't even put their feet on the ground, and they wash their hands. I was like, what? What kind of a lunatic will do that? So whatever didn't fit well in my mind, I was like, no, 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 these religious people, they're making things up. Because it was very hard for me, because I was like, what? It was very hard for me to give up my life. I was like, I'm not going to go to movies anymore. I'm not going to go out with girls anymore. I'm not going to go to the beach anymore. Every time I go to a restaurant, I have to see if it's kosher. It was too much. I was like, okay, I'll do the basics, but don't give me the hard things. It's too much. I cannot do it. And at some point, I knew that I have to keep Shabbat. I was like, how am I going to do this? What, I'm not going to drive? Okay, I'll drive, but I'll not. I was trying to make deals. I'll do this. No, this is too much. I'm not going to. But I knew I have to keep Shabbat. And I didn't know what to give up. And at the time, I was a very, very heavy smoker. I used to smoke like three packs of cigarettes every day. And I remembered that 10 years before this whole thing happened, I met this religious person who tried to, you know, make care of me. He came and he told me, you know, there's a God. I told him, you are a Meshuggah. He told me, you know, you have a Shaman in your body. I told him, you must be hallucinating. Everything that he told me, I was like, I, I ha, a whole hour and a half, he was trying to talk to me, and he made a brick wall. Want to put fill in? No. Want to do this? No. A whole hour and a half, he's trying to get through me. Finally, he almost gave up, and he told me at the end, look, Tishma, on Shabbat, you're not allowed to light fire. And on Shabbat, you're not allowed to extinguish fire. So if you must smoke on Shabbat, at least don't turn out your cigarettes. So if you smoke 60 cigarettes a day, and you don't turn out your cigar or the cigarettes on Shabbos, then you have 60 less sins. I told him, what? You're telling me not to turn out cigarettes? Tell me not to kill. Tell me not to steal. You're telling me not to, to turn out cigarettes? That's your religion? I thought the guys are uh, completely crazy. Ten years later, when I had to keep Shabbat, I was like, wait a minute. I just found a loophole. I'm going to smoke. Finish the cigarette, put it in the ashtray, I keep Shabbat. So I would smoke, finish the cigarette, put it in the ashtray, and I have Shabbat. If somebody would ask me, yeah, I keep Shabbos. Yeah, but I just saw you drive. No, you like to drive. I just don't, earn, don't turn out my cigarettes. And in my mind, that was the Shabbat, not to turn out the cigarettes. And if Chaz Shalom, I would forget, <gasps> why, 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 they're going to barbecue me now again. No, oh, I didn't turn out my, turn out my cigarette by mistake. And that was my Shabbat, not to turn out cigarettes for three months. That was, you know what was a challenge it was? To remember not to turn out the cigarettes. And later on, I added another thing and another thing. And at some point, a friend told me, you know, on Shabbat, you have to do Kiddush. I told him, oh, why? I'll do that. But I was, everything that I would do, I would do with all my heart. I was like, okay, I'm not going to do most of the stuff, but at least what I do, I do it all the way. So I would drive 60 miles because where I lived was in the very south part of Chicago. I would drive 60 miles to the north part of Chicago to buy kosher wine. And every Friday would come, I would get dressed nice in a nice suit, make a beautiful meal, set the table, do the whole show, come, do my kiddush, drink my wine, and then go out to see a movie. And one time, a friend came to visit me, and I told him, it's Shabbat, we have to do kiddush. So we do the whole thing, I put my suit, we set the table, I do kiddush, we eat the meal, and we go out to a club. So on the way back from the club, 4 o'clock in the morning, my friend tells me, you know, <laughs> you're kind of making a joke out of the whole thing. I told him, what do you mean? He's like, look, either you're religious, and you keep Shabbat, and you can do your kiddush, or you're not. But you cannot do kiddush, and then go out to a club. That's kind of making a joke. So I told him, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. And I'll explain to you what I mean. If you go out now to a playground 
and you see a nine-year-old boy jumping up and down and climbing up the ladders and jumping and up and down, nobody gets excited because all the nine-year-olds do the same thing. But if you see a year-old baby suddenly do a step, everybody's like, wow, look, he walked. Everybody pulls out their cameras. Wow, look, look, he did the step. Everybody gets excited. So I told him, in, my, uh, in Hashem's eyes, I'm this baby. I can only do one step, and then I fall. I didn't grow up religious. I'm not religious for 50 years. For me, I'm not this nine years old that Hashem has big expectations. I'm this baby. But you know what happens right now in Shamaim? When I do Kiddush, let me tell you what happens. Hashem calls all his malachim, all his angels, and tells them, come, come. Look what my little boy did down there. Look, he drove 60 miles to buy kosher wine. He could have gone to the corner store to buy any wine. And he made a nice meal. And he got dressed nice. And he stood for two minutes to say thank you for creating the world. Thank you for this wine. For two minutes he stopped his day to acknowledge that I exist. And I told him, this is what Hashem looks right now. He ignores right now all the things around because he knows I'm this baby. That I can only do a step and then I fall. And Hashem is looking right now at this two minutes of all the effort that was put into the mitzvah. The kavanah, the meaning. He doesn't look at it that later on I did a step and fell. He's like, it's a baby. He, doesn't, he can't do more than that. And tomorrow he'll do two steps. And in the next day he'll do three steps. But right now I'm this baby. And for a year and a half, that's how I was in Chicago. Every day was another step and another step. It was almost impossible to become religious. Miraculously, after a year and a half, I somehow got back to New York. And I was going through some very difficult time. And I met a person who told me, why don't you come tonight? There's a place in, in Manhattan, in Esha Torah. There's a little party. Come, you know, some young people. Maybe you meet some friends. Okay. So I went to this place. And there was a big room like this and a band playing music. And I really didn't feel like being in this room. And, the, and I felt very bad just getting up and leaving. And the, roo- the door was already there. So I moved from this chair to this chair. And then I moved to another chair. I had a plan. Then I moved to another chair. And finally, when I got the right time, I got up and I ran out. But I had very bad intelligence. And instead of running out of the building, I ran into the shul. So I go into the shul. And as I go into the shul, a rabbi is standing a long table with maybe like 30 people, and they're about to start a shiul, a class. And the rabbi tells me, come, come, please join us. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, how am I getting out of that? And I'm like, no, it's very late. I, I got to go home. And, and the rabbi tells me, come, come, join us. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, at least let me put, sit next to the door. It will be easy to run out. So the rabbi puts me right next to him, and he starts giving over the class. And it was the first Torah class I was ever in my life. I never heard any Torah. And suddenly, the guy opens up his mouth, and I'm mesmerized. I'm like shocked from the information that's coming out of his mouth. And I look at the clock every five minutes, and I really had to be somewhere the next day early in the morning, and I can't leave. I'm like, I gotta gotta hear the end. Comes the end of the class, I wake up, I go up to the rabbi, and I tell him, you must be some type of a genius. I don't know how you know so much information. So he tells me, I see you enjoyed the shoe. Why don't you come next week? There's another one. So I told him, you didn't cover the whole thing tonight? <laughs> so he tells me, no, no, come back next week. There's another one. So I come back the next week. I was the first one sitting right next to the rabbi. And I was like that. I couldn't move. There's hash I'm not going to miss that one word. So I went to one class, another class, another class. After a few classes, I got very friendly with the rabbi. And he told me, I see you enjoy my classes. Why don't you come to my house every Thursday night? We study from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. All night we study Zohar. And then we go to a mikveh and then we pray Shacharit and we get ready for Shabbat. So I told him, wow, you know, that's an amazing idea. I really don't have anything else to do between 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. every Thursday night. (laughs) But I'll come. So I come there. Sure enough, the rabbi is sitting with maybe 10 guys and all night. He's teaching Zohar. And all that he's talking about is neshamot and malachim and angels and spiritual worlds and weird things and all sorts of spooky stuff. And in my mind, I'm like, wait a minute, I remember that. Wait a minute, I remember this. So after two of the three of these classes, I was like, you know, this guy seems a little bit cuckoo because if this is what he's teaching, he must be a little bit mishugane. But... I think I can tell him what I went through. 
So I come to this rabbi and I tell him, you know, something happened to me almost two years ago and I never told it to anyone. And I think you are the candidate to hear about it. So he tells me, Vakasha, sit. So I start telling him the story. Now he wasn't patient like you. He was like, no, 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 no. I come to the end and he's looking at me with these piercing eyes, this Yemenite Israeli guy, looking at me with these piercing eyes, telling me in Hebrew, Tameshuga. Are you crazy? And I'm like, what? Now he thinks I'm crazy? Now I'm for sure doomed. And he's looking at me, he's like, are you crazy? Hashem did such a miracle and you're not doing anything? He freaked out. He pulled out my shirt. You're not wearing tzitzit? He freaked out. You have to go to yeshiva. You have to study Torah. He freaked out. The next day, 6 o'clock in the morning, he takes me to Monsi, he knocks on the door of the yeshiva, I have a student for you, he pushes me into the yeshiva, he tells me, don't come out till I get you. <laughs> Three months later, I'm already fully religious. The whole thing. So, I look up to Shemaim, and I tell to Hashem, I did the first part of the deal, look, I'm religious. Now came the second part of the deal. So I go to our Rav, and I tell him, this is the resume, what do I do? So he tells me, for this you have to do this, for this you have to do that. He gives me the whole thing. So, a few months later I meet my wife, a few months later we get married, a few months later we have a baby. A year and a half from that time, not even, I'm fully religious, with a wife, with a kid, did the second part. Okay, now comes the hard part, start telling it to people. Now the first, in the beginning I used to tell it to people that were very close, like in the yeshiva, or a rabbi, so they were very into it, because they were like, you know, it's amazing what you're saying, because everything that you're saying, this, what, you, what you're saying now is written in this Gemara, and what you're saying now is written in this Zohar. So I got very good feedback, and they were very excited about it. But I had to tell it to people who are not religious. So I got my first gig in some shul in Brooklyn for Israelis. Baruch Hashem, they did not give out tomatoes in the entrance, because if they had what to throw at me, they would use it. The whole night they were cursing. Shakran, you liar, get out of here, Meshuga. For two hours I'm standing there and just getting curses and insultments. And in my mind I'm like, that's what I'm going to have to deal now with the rest of my life? <laughs> and the whole time I see this one guy at the end, shivering, the whole night. He comes to me at the end of the night, he tells me, I believe every word you said, what do I have to do? So in my mind I was like, oh, okay. If all this I had to go through for one person to to do something, to change his way, then Baruch I'll, I'll take that. So, for about four years, I used to go and speak in shuls and yeshivot and all sorts of places, and I would come, speak, finish, and go. And a few years ago, something happened, and it changed how I looked at things. And one day, my brother-in-law, a very young, healthy man, went out for a jog, got a heart attack, and died on the spot. So, my sister calls me, I fly to Eretz Israel, being the only religious person in the family, they waited for me, I come off the plane straight to the Bet Kvarot, to the cemetery, I walk into the room of the Hevre Kadisha, and in Israel they don't bury in a box like here, they bury it in a, in a talit. So the body is on the bed, after the Tahara, but without the talit, and I see my brother-in-law, and my instinct, I pull out a Sefer Tehilim, and I start reading Tehilim, and my sister's next to me crying. And I look at the body and I was like, wait a minute. He's on the ceiling. He's looking down now. And he hears my tehillim. And he hears my sister crying. And he knows what I ate for breakfast. And he knows everything that's going on now because I remember that I was like that. And he hears everything now and he sees everything. And he knows everything. And now he's going here, and now he's going there. And I was like, wait a minute. You know what was my problem? The thing is with my brother-in-law, you can't really judge a book by its cover. Because some person, you would look at the person, he looks very religious, with a nice beard and a hat and the whole costume, and the inside is all rotten. But on the other hand, can be a person on the outside doesn't look religious at all, but the inside is pure and honest and with good midot. So you can't really look at a person and judge the situation. Only Hashem knows. 
But this particular person, from what I knew, was not Shomer Torah and Mitzvot at all. And I was looking at him, I was like, what's going on? I, I, you know, where is he right now? I know what's going on right now. Now this malach is coming and punching him from here, and now this is coming and throwing him from there. And in my mind, I was like, you know what was my problem when I was up there? Not that I wasn't religious. My problem that I didn't even have a mitzvah. That was my problem. My problem was that I wasn't able to say up there, well, relax, hey, stop the, so, well, one minute, stop the trial. You're right. I didn't keep Shabbat, and I didn't eat kosher, and I didn't give this, and I didn't do that. But you know what I did? I would put fill in every day. I have a mitzvah. I didn't even have that. I was not able to wave in Shamaim, wait, whoa, oh, you're right. I'm not a tzaddik, but I used to do this. And I used to go to a Torah class once a week. And I used to do this. And I used to light candles on Shabbat. I didn't even have a half a mitzvah to, to, to save me. To have any connection to Hashem. And I was looking at my brother and I was like, maybe he doesn't have this mitzvah. What's going on? A person lives his life, 60, 70, 80 years, if he's lucky. Like as if this world is like a vacation. And then it ends and then what? What do you do? Where do you go? What happens? The funniest thing is that in this world, everybody insures everything that moves. You insure your car, you insure your house, you insure your health, you insure your cell phone. If it falls in the toilet, at least you can get a new one. Some people are very mehade and they insure their life. If they die, then at least their wife and kids get money. But everything that moves, you insure. Why do you insure everything? Why do you insure your car? Well, you expect to get into an accident? No, but if, chas v'shalom, I get into an accident, at least I have insurance. And why do you insure your health? You expect to get in to become sick? No. If, chas v'shalom, I become sick, then, uh, then I have insurance. We don't do anything. We don't, most people don't live their life and saying, ah, you know, one day I'll die and I'll go somewhere and I need something. And most people don't really plan their, their life. Now the thing is that I don't like looking in that direction because a lot of places that I go, they tell me, you know, you have to scare people because they, if they don't do mitzvot, they go to Gernom and they rip the pieces there. And a lot of people think that if you come and scare somebody, then they'll, they'll get their act together. I like looking at it a completely different way because you know what's going to happen very soon? Mashiach is going to come any day. And when Mashiach is going to be here, he's going to have... A personal meeting with each person. Now what's going to happen to a person that comes into the meeting, sits in front of the king, and the king tells him, what did you do to hasten the gula? What did you do to make me come faster? What did you do? Now if a person did a lot of mitzvot and learned a lot of Torah and everything, then he can tell the king what he did, Melech HaMashiach, and the king will be very proud and will be a lot of honor. But what if the person has nothing to say? What is he going to tell the king? Uh, I was on Facebook. You know? What did you do all day long? Uh, I was in the beach. So the thing is that I can't really tell you my entire story. And it doesn't really matter. Even if I tell you the entire story, every little deal, it does, that does not make any difference. Nahon, the story is very interesting and a lot of special effects. But the thing is that most people, after a week, forget half of the story. After two weeks, forget everything. After three weeks, forget even my name. I made people, oh, I saw you. No, you have this weird thing. People don't remember. After a month, they don't even remember my name. So there's not really have a point to go too much into the story because the story happened to me. The story happened to me that I will become religious. So I can't really give over what I felt. I can't give over my pain, my Happiness, my feeling, what I felt, I can't give it over. The only thing that I can give over is that if you sat here now for two hours and you leave this door at the end of the night and nothing changed, then you, you wasted two hours of your, of, your, of your life. But if you leave this door with a change of mind, that from this second, not tomorrow and not next week and not in a month, tonight, 
I'm already saying Kriyat Shema Lamita, and tomorrow morning I'm waking up and straight away doing Itilat Yadayim, and I'm going to pray with Shacharit, with a Minyan, and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. If you leave this room, then in your mind you're like, okay, what am I getting out of these two hours? And I'm going home to sleep, or am I going home to get my act together? Because there's no time. There's no time to waste. Not a second, not a minute, not a day. In any direction you look at it, there's no time to waste. And if you leave out this door and say, okay, very nice story, he's a nice guy, he told a few jokes, and he has a very long beard, good, but I'm back to my life, then you wasted your own time. If you want to be smart, you leave from this door and you say, well, I'm holding here, where am I holding tomorrow? And what am I going to do the next day? And what am I going to do in a week? And what am I going to do in two weeks? And I'm, let me plan now what I'm doing. I can't do everything in one day, but at least today I'm adding this. Tomorrow I'm adding that. The next day I'm adding this. David HaMelech says, Mi Behar Hashem. Going closer to Hashem is climbing a mountain. One day, another day, another step, another step, another step. And it's harder, and it gets harder and harder. The harder it gets, the in a better situation you are. People say, oh, I'm becoming religious, I'm doing so many mitzvot, and it's becoming worse. Yes, because the more you get closer to Hashem, the harder it gets. There's a major rule. When you ride a bike, if it's easy, must, must be that you're going down. That's how it works. If it's hard, it means you're going up. So if you're in Avodat Hashem, everything is easy, you're going down. You're not going anywhere. If it's hard, if there's kshayim, there's problems, there's Yetzirah that comes to drive you crazy. Every day is a struggle. It means you're going up. And another step. And another step. So much more so if you bow tshuva and you have to kill and erase the past. You build an army of Malachim for 20, 30 years. You have to kill it. Of course it's going to be hard. You think you're going to get the million dollar prize for nothing? This world is hard. But lefum tzahara agra. The, more it's, the harder it gets the better, the greater your reward is. And the, the way how I saw how the, this world works is put in a very short mashal. There was once a king, and the king had a son, an only son. Finally, the king's son got married, got engaged. There was a wedding, a big chatuna. They sent out invitation to the entire city, the entire country. One guy gets an invitation in the mail. Can you imagine the excitement? Opening up an invitation to the king's son's wedding. Wow, he went and bought a beautiful suit. He got excited. He pinned the invitation to the wall. Every day he was counting the day for the wedding. On the other side of town, one guy didn't get an invitation in the mail. A whole entourage of ministers generals, the second to the king, the king's advisors, everybody came to personally invite this person. The day of the wedding comes, the guy who got the invitation put on his nice new suit, gets all set up, goes down, puts his invitation in his pocket. He's about to leave the building and it starts pouring rain. So he says to himself, how am I going to get now to the bus stop? I'm going to get soaking wet. So he sees the bus, he's like, the second the bus comes a little bit closer, I'll run, I'll get a little bit wet, and I'll make it. He takes the run, the bus doesn't wait, and he starts running after the bus, and he falls into a puddle, gets completely soaking wet. He gets up, starts running after the bus, wait, wait, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta catch the bus, I gotta go to the wedding. And he's running and getting soaking wet, he falls into a puddle again, the bus shh, disappears. He starts walking to the next bus stop. He's like, I'm going to be late now to the wedding. On the road, a bunch of robbers meet him. They rob him. He keeps on going. A bunch of hoodlums pick him up, beat him up. The guy goes through hell. On the other side of town, the guy who got the invitation from all the ministers, you can't even believe who picks him up. Limousines, helicopters in the air, motorbikes with guards all surrounding him, soldiers carrying him into the limousine. Finally, the other guy gets to the wedding, soaking wet, blood all over his face. He got robbed, he got mugged, he's soaking wet the whole day. He finally gets to the king, to the palace. The doors are closed, the guards are telling him, can we help you? So he tells them, I have an invitation, I'm, I'm, I'm invited to the wedding. So they're telling him, can we see the invitation, please? 
He pulls the invitation out of his pocket. He's so soaking wet, there's nothing left from the invitation. So they're telling him, we're very sorry, we can't accept it. This is not an invitation, you've got to go home. So he tells him, no, 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 no. You, have, you have a mistake. I was invited. This is an invitation. Check your lists. No, 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 we're sorry, we can't let you in. So they're telling him, he tell him, you know what I went through? I was, look at me, I was mobbed, I was robbed, I was beaten up, I'm starving, I didn't eat anything all day long. So they're saying, oh, you're hungry, no problem. So they take out a plate of sushi and a bottle of 7-Up and they give him, here, eat, bevakasha. And he's telling them, please, no, you gotta let me in, I'm invited. You can't go in. So he looks through the gate and he sees the king sitting at the head table. Right next to the king sits the son, the groom. And right next to the king on this side sits the guy who came with all the fancy schmancy stuff. And he tells them, please let me in, I'm invited to the wedding. No, he cannot come in. If you're hungry, we'll give you another plate of sushi. So the story comes to teach us something very, very simple. We all are invited to the wedding. And we're all going to get to the wedding. The question is, how are you going to get to the wedding? What's going to be the process? What's going to be the way to the wedding? And when you're finally there, where are you going to be? Are you going to be next to the king? Or are you going to be outside, blood, wet, with a plate of sushi? And they're telling you, you come, come in. The question is, this life is the preparation of how we're going to set the eternity. What you do in this world, it echoes in eternity. What you do in this world will affect where you're going to sit in the wedding. Do you want to sit next to the king for eternity and get all that goes with the king and going the, the, the journey all nice and smooth? Or you want to get up there with beating up and being beat up from all directions and, and at the end you're still outside? A lot of people say, yeah, I have a security, I'm there. Yeah, you might be outside. And you might look inside and be like, oh, what did I miss? I'm stuck outside right now. Then what? So, the way you conduct your life here, you're setting up, you're building the investment for eternity. For eternity. You have now 60, 70, 80 years, if you're lucky, to set your investment. Every second, you can grab another mitzvah. Another mitzvah. Another good deed. Another good thought. You know how I saw this world? In a very simple way. Imagine you take a person and you tell this person, you have three hours to go into this jewelry store and everything that's in the store you can take. It's yours. Three hours. So one person will come and be like, I don't want anything. I have a watch. It's a nice watch. I don't need to go in. I don't need anything. One person will say, oh, okay, so he'll put some jewelry in his pocket, some watches, some rings, some earrings, some diamond rings. The third and smart one would say, what? You're telling me for three hours I can do here whatever I want? He goes home and brings boxes and starts putting in the boxes all the jewelry, all the watches, all the earrings, all the diamonds. This is this world. Hashem tells you, you have 60, 70, 80 years in this world. Whatever you want. It's yours. Free. Just take. So one person will be, eh, I, I don't need it. Another person will be like, okay, I'll take a few here, a mitzvah, there, a mitzvah. The smart person says, what? You mean that every second I can grab another mitzvah? Another mitzvah, another mitzvah? I... A smart person realizes the opportunity in this world. Not to really to say, ah, okay, I'll do here once a week, I'll go to a shiur, and once every month I'll do this. You're missing out. You're missing out. Every second in this world, you're grabbing... A mitzvah. If you would know what's a mitzvah, you would not stop running after mitzvot. If I would have to compare to money what's a mitzvah, then one mitzvah is $500 billion. So you make 100 mitzvahs a day, just imagine what's going on in your bank. And you can't even compare that. So it's ben aroch. You can't even compare the sachar of mitzvah for netzach, netzachim, eternity. What's one second in this world? Every second you are stepping on diamonds. All you have to do is grab them. So to tell you my entire story, there's no point. The point is that you need to leave out of this room and say, how am I grabbing these diamonds every day? Where am I getting better? How am I securing that my eternity 
is full of these diamonds, these mitzvot. And more than that, not to think just of yourself and say, oh, I'll, just me, I'll put all these diamonds in the boxes. Go call all your family and friends because everything is free. To keep this for yourself, that's nice. Shem is very happy when you're very from, when you're very religious. But the more religious, religious you get, Hashem looks at you and tells you, what about your friend? Why aren't you inviting your friend to a shiur? Why aren't you inviting your friend to a sudat shabbat? Why don't you tell your friend to put fill in? Why don't you convince your friend to come to another shiur, light candles? It's not enough just looking at our own area. You have to constantly, every, every little person, wake them up. So in a second, we're going to go, I'll give you time to ask whatever you want. A quick, short announcement. If chas v'shalom, you use Facebook, then I have a very busy page on Facebook that I load a lot of classes there, a lot of shiurim, a lot of posts. If you don't, don't get close to it. But if you're already on it, then at least utilize the time. Go look my name, Alona Nava. There's cards at the end. You can take it. There's a website where I have my video on it. You can spread the video, tell people that weren't able to be here to go and look at the video. The video is on YouTube. It's on Everywhere you look, the video is there. If somebody wants to have CDs, you can order. I, can, I send you, I'll send you the mail DVDs with the, with, the, with the video of it. Like Rabbi Yaniv said before, if you have a community, you have a shul, you have a place you want to invite me, I go everywhere. They fly me everywhere. I've been to Australia, to England, to Israel. Everywhere they fly me. I speak every night. You can invite me. Even if it's for 20 people, if it's a little room, it's a little house, a little yeshiva, you can invite me. But more than that, the only thing that I can really leave you from this night is that every little thing that you do in this world echoes in eternity. Every little thing that you do, like putting your leg into a puddle of water, you see this ripple, another ripple, that's how it is in this world. So I wish you great success in all that you do. Hatzlachah bakol, everything you should do should be, should be blessed. For Hashem, whoever needs parnasah should have it in... in, in a great Ashirut, whoever needs a Shidur should get married right away, who needs health, should have a lot of health and kids, everything should be Beribui, and we should marry to see already Premashiach Tzidkenu, and it should happen very speedy in our days. And every mitzvah that we do, Rambam says that right now the world is 50-50. Only, we only need this one little mitzvah that will tilt the world to Kavzchut. And we do not know who's this Jew, and what's this mitzvah that will do that. So we have a great, great mission to, to completely shift the world. And it's mamash karov elenu. It's literally in our days. And it's all in our hands. Every little mitzvah makes a big difference. Every time you stop yourself from doing something, a clean, a pure thought, about to say something, a lie, stop it. Every little thing is a huge difference. People come and tell me, ah, oh, you know, I do the big things. I keep Shabbat, and I put filin on, and I do this and this. It's very nice. But all the little things I don't do, because I don't see any importance to that. Dafka, the little things are important. There's not one thing. The Mishnah tells you, yes, Zahir be mitzvah kalake vachamura. Ken chayodeh matan zcharan. Be very careful with the little mitzvahs. Not like the big ones, because you don't know the merit of each little mitzvah. A lot of people say, ah, oh, I'm religious. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. But here to lie, ah, eh, that's okay. Here lo shonarat, that's fine. Here I do this, ah, eh, it's, it's okay. Every little mitzvah, Every little thing, every little second is a huge in the eyes of Hashem. A lot of people think that the little things don't make sense. Oh, Hashem cares when I put filin on. Oh, Hashem cares when I keep Shabbat. Yeah, Hashem also cares when you do the little things. When you shut your mouth at the right second. When you close your eyes at the right second. When you move your head from the wrong place. Every little thing, a thought that you're stopping yourself from doing, it's a huge thing. Every little thing. When I was up there, they showed me every little, little things. How I saw how in Hashem's eyes, you know, even dragging the tzitzit on the floor. Shulchan Aruch says it's bizayon la mitzvah to drag the tzitzit on the floor. That was looked all upon like this. Wow, look what he did. The Ben Ishchai said that even if the retzua shel the tefillin, the string, is hanging down while you're taking it off, Oy vavoy. And here I see people, I go to shoes, I see them dragging the tefillin on the floor. Hashem looks at every little thing. And every little thought, every little thing, even if the whole day, 
You, you couldn't stand the Yetzirah. You failed this, you failed this, you failed this, you failed that. Don't look at all the bad, what you didn't do. Look how much good you can do. Every little thing you can do. A little bit of light diminishes a lot of darkness. So, Bezrat Hashem, I wish you great success in all that you do. If any of you have questions, please feel free to ask. And I don't know how, when we have to live here, but Bezrat Hashem, once they tell us to live, well, you can uh, let me live. Yes? All the neshamot of all the Jews from all generations. Everybody, including the people who are alive. Rabbi, if you, if you said that you were poured with uh, so much knowledge and you became like you felt like a genius, and when you came back and you remembered that you were there and whatever happened and what was poured into you, why, why didn't you it stay? Had, why you still didn't have the knowledge of all those things that need to be done in this world? I'm just going to repeat the question in case of somebody didn't hear. He's asking, if I saw all the wisdom of the universe and all this chokhmah went through me and I saw it and experienced it, how could it be that when I came back here, I didn't have anything of it? And the answer is very, very simple. Take now this cup, stand under Niagara Falls and try to catch the water and you're only going to catch this because your cup, your vessel, can only hold a very limited amount of water. I wasn't even a vessel to hold this information. If you want to hold this information, you have to have a vessel. The neshama can come up to Shalim, see everything. If he doesn't have a vessel, a kli, that it created in this world, it will not hold anything. The sachar in Gan Eden is what you did in this world. What you did in this world creates this kli, this vessel. Then... Mitzvot, Masim Tovim, studying Torah, every little thing you do, you make a kli. So if a person lives down in this world, and all day long was running after mitzvot, every mitzvah that he do, it's like a hard drive. So one memory card is 12 megabytes, one mem memory card is 2 gigs, and one memory card is 120 gigs. Technology can teach us a lot about the lukut. The same size little thing. How can you see how many gigs go in a little piece of plastic? Same with the neshama. The neshama can inflate, spiritually, can inflate and so forth. The more mitzvot you do, the greater your capacity, the more meida you can not only see, but hold. So I didn't even have a vessel to hold anything. So it was just washing me. So I saw it. I experienced the, the pleasure, the, the impression state, because I remember a lot of things. When I came back to this world, I remember, I knew things. When I used to go to this rabbi, to the Shurei Zohar, I was like, wait a minute, I remember this. When I first went into Yeshiva and I started learning Halachot, I was like, I remember these, these things. But the most, most of it I didn't remember, nothing stayed. Mainly because I didn't have a clue to hold it. The whole point, and this is the concept of schar mitzvah mitzvah, because the schar of the mitzvah is the mitzvah. is the fact that you are sitting in Gan Eden, the neshama sits in Gan Eden, and a tzaddik is here, and a greater tzaddik is here, and a greater tzaddik is here. But Gan Eden has end of madrigot. And the more you did in this world, the greater the capacity is. Going back to the mashal that I said, the closer you are to the king. So you can be in Gan Eden, you can be a very nice Jew, but sitting in what's called Gan Eden Tachton, in a very low level, everything is fine. But you look up there, and the eyes of the neshama, it doesn't have neshama, but the eyes of neshama burn from what it can see what somebody in the madriga above it is. That's why neshamot sit in Gan Eden and they look down to the world and if they have the opportunity to come down to the world, they come down. Because they understand, wait a minute, right now I'm here in Gan Eden and if I go down to the world, I have to go through all sedar ishtal shilut, all neshama has to go through all the worlds down into a body in to go through labor, has to live his entire life, go through sins and tzarot and, and bayot and all these problems, then die, then go through all the process the neshama has to go up there. The neshama makes a calculation. I can go through all these yisurim, but in this world I can do a mitzvah. I can wear tzitzit for five minutes, then right now I'm in Gan Eden here, I'll wear tzitzit for five minutes, then I can go to Gan Eden here. The neshama understands the, the, the concept of yerida, Going down, it's so to go higher. And the more 
you want to go higher, רצה הקדוש ברוך הוא להרבות עם ישראל, לפיכך, רצה הקדוש ברוך הוא לזכות את ישראל, לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות. השם told you, I want to give you more, but go down there, do a lot of מצוות, that you'll have a greater capacity to hold more godly revelation. So my only problem was that I didn't even have a כלי. That's why nothing was stayed. And it made me realize how what's every second here, you're expanding the vessel. Another mitzvah, another mitzvah, another. And you, we can't fathom it in our brain what it means, one mitzvah. I always give the same example. One time I was coming back from a lecture like this. It was upstate in, uh, in, uh, in Westchester. So when I came out, it was like three in the morning, seven hour lecture. My mind was like, Pfft. and I knew I have an hour to drive home. So my first instinct was, okay, I'm going to put a nice CD on, turn the music on, open the window, sit like this, wind on my air, relax. I put the CD on, I play the music, and then I was like, wait a minute. What am I getting again out of an hour listening to music and going like this? I can take this CD out, put a CD of a Torah class, and learn Torah for a whole hour. So what am I going to gain? Here, I'm going to gain a headache. because I'm going to be like this for an hour, and the wind will feel very nice on my face. And on the other hand, I gain a whole hour of Limud Torah. So you, you, you measure to these two, you're like, of course I want this. This is nonsense. So every second in the day, you can say, can I do this? Oh, I can do this. Should I do this? No, I can do this. That's what it means. There's a lot of explanations to behold but every second in this world, you're grabbing another storage for this godly revelation, and that's the clea, that's how you build the clea. Od mitzvah, another mitzvah, another shiur Torah, another shiur, another good deed, od maset tov, another, every little thing. Your day has 24 hours. The year has 365 years. When the neshama comes down to this world, Hashem tells you, you have exactly the time. There's no such a thing. The neshama knows exactly how much time it came down to the world, and it has a mission to complete in this time. And every second that it doesn't complete it, it's missing out. And it basically goes up to Shammayim, and it didn't serve Hashem b'shlemut. So every second here, not only that you're fulfilling your entire mission, also you're building this kli. And then you're able to get the entire godly revelation where the neshama sits in Gan Eden and, and enjoys this giluim. And in the time of Tchiyat HaMetim and Tzimot HaMashiach, we still need that because... You know, there's going to be this godly light shining in the world. It says, when Mashiach comes, Kadosh Baruch Hu Motzi Chama Min Artika. Hashem takes out the sun out of its, out of its, uh, like a socket. And the Rashaim Nidonim, the Rashaim, they melt from the heat. And the Tzitzadikim, wow. So the more you have a capacity, the more you enjoy in this world. Judge, I couldn't see. The... I know, I couldn't see anyone. Some people see the judges. He was asking who was the judge. I couldn't see anyone. I was so, huh? No, Shem just stands there. There's judges in the courts, like exactly like you said. In each generation, sometimes it's, it's the gdolim of the generations. I know a few people that I spoke to who had similar things. They, their judge was the Ben Ishchai. It was different uh, tzaddikim. I was in such a low level, they didn't even let me see who was judging me. I couldn't see anything. But the thing is, no, Hashem doesn't judge you. You know who judges you? Yourself. That's how it is. They, they put, no, not the shame. They, what they do, the neshama? They put, they show the neshama a sin, and they tell the neshama, okay, you judge it. And the neshama says, oh, I think it should get this and this and this. Or they like this and like that. And then they tell the neshama, that is you. So they let you judge your own, your own judgment. That's why we learn to constantly li, li, to give every person ladun le kav schut. Because you get used to constantly ladun people to kav schut. So eventually you're going to judge yourself to kav schut. And then you say, oh no, this poor person, look at the etzer ara he had. Give, give him a break. And then they're telling him, okay, that's you. So mainly the judgment is you. But there are judges that, that I wasn't able to see. I don't know who they were. David and Yonatan? David and Yonatan. Yeah, exactly. Yes. 
were talking about a vessel earlier. Is there anything a person that could do that they break down the vessel? Yeah. When a person doesn't have a ra, he makes a crack. Take now a cup and quench it, you break it. Yeah, you read. the thing is that any time that you do good, a mitzvah, or you refrain from an avera, you build the, the vessel. If chas v'shalom, a person did an avera, yeah, he broke some of the vessel. It's a problem. It's a big thing. A lot of people say, oh, I have a lot of mitzvot, I'll be fine. You're not going to be fine. Because if you damage your vessel, you know, this, this is where it comes a little bit more complex. The vessel is one thing, the levushim of the, of the nefesh is a different thing. But the, the, the broad answer is yes, a person can damage his vessel. A person can live his life 10, 20 years religious and then go off the derech and be completely kofer. And, uh, you know, even though the mitzvah remains with you forever, but let ata, the mitzvah, actually, the, the, the schar of the mitzvah is taken away from that person. When a person does a sin and at that particular second he's judged in Shamaim, he's called rasha. At this point, everything that he has is taken away till he does tshuva. So a person with his wrong actions ruins the vessel in this world. Yes. Wait, wait, hold on. Do you still see your future? Huh? Do you still see your future? If I see my future? Do you still see your future? Uh, what I saw, I remember a lot of the things and I saw it. A lot of it happened already. But I don't walk around and give uh, nevuot. <laughs> but... Uh, but when I, you know that that night, when I, the, I went into the room and the rabbi and the, the whole party, that's the first night I saw my wife from across the room and I recognized her. And only half a year later, the rabbi did a shiduch between us and I, he tells me, I have a nice girl for you to meet. And he tells me, here it is. And I look at him like, okay, if you, <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> but, but when she walked into the car, I looked at her and I was like, that's my wife. So, Baruch Hashem, every time we have a kid, I tell my wife, we have a girl, we have a boy. A lot of the things I remember, but the big things I don't remember. I don't remember the lottery numbers, and I don't remember who's going to win the Super Bowl, and, but I remember general things. Yes? Okay, so, do you live your life based on what you saw of your life in the future, or is it going based on what you, how you saw it? Neither. Okay. What I saw... Yeah, what I saw, I, first of all, I don't remember most of it. What I remember is very general things. I remember my wife, I remember all my kids, how they looked, I remember my wedding, I remember certain events in my life. So far, Baruch Hashem, five, but we're not done. Uh, a lot of the events in my life already happened, and a lot of the things happened, and when it happened, I was like, oh, I remember it. Kind of like a deja vu, but the real thing. But the real, real deja vu. So what language did you communicate in... All Lashon Kodesh. Just Hebrew. Do you remember? Oh, like actual Hebrew, what we speak now? No. The thing is that th the in communication... The hmm? In Aramaic? No. That it's Mamash Lashon Kodesh. But the thing is that this is where it's very difficult to explain. Because there wasn't words. There wasn't a sound. There wasn't an ear to hear. It's kind of like a dream. Now, in a dream, there's no sounds. And in a dream, there's no voices. And in a dream, there's not really a word. You understand everything. It's called hasaga. You understand. And one second you hear, and one second you're there, and one time you hear, and you look at your father in the dream. It doesn't look like your father. Everything is a mishmash in the dream. This is like, you know how we say, This world is the dream. And when I came back down to this world, it was like waking up to the dream. Like, we think we're alive. This is like a dream. And how I felt there was magnified like the real thing. So there wasn't really words. It was in a level that I don't know how to explain it. How you was mentally after all that? How I was mentally? How I didn't lose it? Baruch Hashem. Hashem, you know, when Hashem puts you, know, you back in the goof. Like, wow. And why it took four and a half years until to be a religion? Two years. Mm -hmm. oh, two years. Because when you're 28 years old and you live your life a certain way and suddenly you have to stop everything... That's not easy. You say, okay, I was like, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. But Peter, ah, now you're telling me every day. It's a hard, not an easy life. So, you know, when you're in the life. So they have basically, there was nothing, nothing that you keep, like uh, something. Nothing. nothing. Shem Rachem, not even one thing. What about now, your family is religious? My parents, Boch Hashem, can. But uh, when I grew up, the only thing that I did when I grew up was they taught me in school which wasn't the real thing. So Hanukkah for me was eight days off school. Pesach was three weeks off school. 
Sukkot, two weeks vacation. That was, you know, and everything was, that was taught in school in Israel. They tell you the story, but they take a shem out of it. So uh, the, I knew a lot of things. You live in Israel, you can't not know. I had friends in the army that were religious. It's not that I didn't know. I hated it. Hashem Erechem Bechavana on Yom Kippur, I used to do a barbecue to, ex- to annoy my neighbors. I was like very hateful, like a lot of the Israelis. So whatever I knew, I decided and I chose. That was my problem. Because if you don't know anything, you know, the post of all generations says, Tinok what do you want from him? He's a little boy. He's a baby. He was a baby that was captured Ben Agoim. So how the Gemara calls it. That's if you don't know. What you don't know, you don't get judged. But if you know, you have a problem. In that tool, did you get any message from Hashem? Like, uh... Every day, Hashem was holding my hand. <laughs> At that two years, I was met like a prophet. Every day, Hashem was holding my hands. These two years were miracle of a miracle of a miracle. I have stories from, from that time. Because I needed, you asked hey, how I didn't become Meshuggah. Because I had Hashem holding my hand. Wow. Telling me every day, you're normal. Tamshikh, you're good. Yes. I can't hear you. When I became, no, my parents are not religious at all. When you were a child, nothing. Now? Nothing. And now, now, Hashem. But when I grew up, nothing. We didn't have nothing in the house, not kiddush, nothing. My mom didn't do candles, anything, not kosher. Pesach was a meal. It wasn't a little seder. It was a meal and presents and two weeks of school. The, 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 even whatever was religion was, wasn't religion. So I didn't have anything at home. When you was there, you saw your parents crying. When you came down here, did you ask them if it's so kind of... No. Nothing? There, the neshama, can, this is something that our mind cannot understand, but the same way that Hashem sees forward and knows what's going to happen, it's like as if the neshama could, could like as if they showed me what could have happened. How do you believe your story? Who? Your parents. How? How do thousands of people believe my story? Of, of course. For, the thing is how with my parents, it was very hard for me to tell my parents the story because I, I knew my mom is going <laughs> to... So for the first two years, nobody knew anything. Then I told them I became religious and they were like, why are you religious? I'll tell you one time. So, and the beginning was very hard for them because they thought I'm Meshuga. And they, they was... It took it for them a while to realize that I'm actually the same person. So you moved here after the army? Yeah. Now, only after like four or five years when my brother-in-law died, then I told my parents. Oh, then I told everybody because then, you know, I had to open the can of worms. Then everything came out. But it was very hard. Can you imagine me telling my mom, yeah, I, I took drugs. I overdosed in the back seat of a car. Eh, it was nothing, you know. But, you know, I couldn't break my mother's heart. But even before that, they already started, you know, uh, here my stepfather started putting tefillin, my mother started lighting candles. Now, Baruch Hashem. But uh, it's not easy to become religious. Kacha. Yes. Do you remember the... Uh, ten minutes. Berich, ten minutes. Do you remember, like, the first safer you took down when you, like, embarked on your uh, journey of, like, becoming Jewish? Uh, and religious. What was the first, first book? The first safer you did like independently that you like started like playing. was it like a small book? Like I, I'm sure you didn't just jump into like uh, doing Zohar and everything. Like, was it, like, the first book was uh, somebody gave me a Kitsur Shulchan Aruch. But the Kitsur. I started just reading all the halachot, all the little things. And then, like, what was, like, the uh, next step? Like, next step? Like, you learned some halachot. Uh, I started kind of being yeshiva right away. The whole city, like, Marach, Hasidut, this, this, Shulchan Aruch, everything. So most of your learning didn't come from, like, did it come from independent learning, or was it just, like, uh, no. being given to you, you know? Because like? the first year and a half, I didn't learn anything. Then when I came to New York, I wa- right away went to Yeshiva. So right away, when I, with my mind was already, okay, I got to become religious. So I was ready. I like took off my, my not religious jacket and I just dived in. So right away I, I was already the clee to start everything. So I learned everything. I was like already thirsty. I had to, to, to catch up big time. So I just covered everything. Of course, with the time I started learning more. I started learning, you know, more Pnimiuta Torah. Different like uh, sources coming from like everywhere. Basically. Well, the thing is, when you start becoming religious and you want to do it the right way, and there's an order how you want to do it. You first you you want to learn Mishnah before you were learn the Gemara, and then you want to learn Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, then you learn Shulchan Aruch, then you start learning the Tur and. 
you, you can just uh, come and okay, I want to be really just give me the hardest Gemara. You have to also learn the, 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 how to learn it. You have to learn the, the language. So, but the first and easiest is to take Kitzur Shulchan Aruch and to learn the basics, what I'm, not, what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. Then when you already kind of master that, you're like, okay, now I know what I'm allowed to, what I'm not allowed to. Now let me learn where it comes from. Now let me learn the reason for that. Now let me, like, Dil Torah Veladir. But you can't, like, say, oh, I'm just, I just like this. You, you need, you know, the entire thing. Torah, learning Torah is like nutrition. You can't just have water or just fruits or just vitamins. You need everything. You need minerals, vitamins, everything. So the Torah is exactly the same. Which one? Which one you were first into? The first one was Ora Torah in Monsi. Then I moved to Brooklyn. Then I started going through different uh, yeshiva. And then I ended up in yeshiva, what's called Hadar Torah in Brooklyn. And I actually, till today, I'm there. Because the Rosh, Rosh Yeshiva is something out of this world. So I still, um, I still learn there half a day. Why do you, what does everybody say that uh, when you're by Mashiach time, just because there's a war in Israel, where do you get this word? Everybody says that we've been mistaken a lot of times. Uh, the thing is like this. First of all, there's many simanim in... Simanim were before as well. No, not exactly. No, not exactly how it is now. But not how it's now. The thing is that there's different sources in Gemarot that tell you how the before the Mashiach will be, which matches exactly to now. The sources in the Zohar that tells exactly what's going to happen, and it's a hundred percent like now. The sources in Hasidut and Kabbalah that explains there's a lot, a lot of different sources that tells you exactly, and it's a hundred percent, not fifty years, forty years, thirty years. Besides that, you know how many Gdolim in our generation that they, they, in their Ruach HaKodesh or in their level say it's Mamash Achshav? There's besides Nevuot in the actual Nevi'im, there's different Nevuot that, you know, a lot of people don't, don't really know about them that saw everything, that this is Mamash the time. Mamash till the dot. Now nobody knows it can be a year, Chas Shalom, can be three years, can be five years, Chas Shalom. The way how, how I saw it, it was like around the corner. It was mamash achshav. Now, chaz v'shalom, you know, the, the, the geula can come in, in two different ways. Either be ito, at the time that it's scheduled to come, and we don't want that to happen because it means we're going to have to wait. Or v'achishena, which means that we work, we bring enough merits to Am Israel, and the geula comes faster. How and fast we can do it, it all depends on us. But there's, there's many and enough sources that sew everything together that tells you it's Mamash Achshav. Not in uh, the 70s in the Yom Kippur War, and not in the 80s in the Milchem Shlom Galil. It's now. And there's so many things that point on exactly how it's going to be that kinda, you kind of have to be not normal in your mind to look at the world and say, oh, it's normal and it will get better. If you just judge the world in the last decade, you see the whole world is... Pfft, going to a, pl- a place it can't be reversed even. You ha- really have to be blind to look at the world and say, nah, Mashiach is not coming. Just how the world is revolving. So besides that, there's enough sources that actually pinpoint that the Gula is very, very close. And I, I, how I saw it, it looked like literally every day. Huh? No, how it looked every day now, not then. No, you're saying when you were... Yeah, yeah. Then when, it, when I saw it 13 years ago, it looked like how now it's ototo. Not 13 years ago ototo. It's very close. Chas v'shalom, the way we are now, that we're like literally in the middle. All it needs is a few of a rod, and we're back on, in a minus. A few mitzvot, and we're like a ship rocking. That's why we need now every mitzvah, every Jew that adds, that comes back, is just for our merit. And you can see even, like, if you literally read all the scriptures and you follow everything around, you, you, you got you to gotta really be blinded to not see that, it's, that the gula is bapetach.